Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of the Be A Boss Coaching Podcast. My name is Beatriz and I am a business and entrepreneur coach, founder of Be A Boss Coaching and podcast host of this podcast. Today I want to introduce Brandy J. Andrews. She is a black Latina queer mother and founder of Youth Dealer Skincare and Luna Vibe Company. Youth Dealer Skincare mission is to bring clean skin care products from the industry's most effective potent and effective formulations using stem cell and botanical extracts from melanated skin. Brandy has over 23 years of experience, awards, and recognition in the beauty industry serving Hollywood's elites such as Lena Waithe, Cynthia Erivo, and many more. Brandy is a creator and visionary, dreams of a space where all communities can feel at home and be able to shop products created just for them and works with experts to care for their skin. I am so grateful to have come across Brandy and her story and her journey as an entrepreneur and someone who is always there for her community. Join me in supporting Brandy at her website at youthdealer.co. And remember to come back to Instagram. Let us know what you thought, any comments, any questions. I will be posting about this on Instagram and of course on YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube, go ahead and click like, comment, share with friends and family. As always, please remember to come on over to BeABossCoaching.com. You can learn more about me, read my blogs, listen to more podcast episodes, and you can even schedule your one hour complimentary call if we're a good fit together for coaching. If you've been exploring coaching, I'd love to get to know more about you. Sign up for our newsletter where you'll find out about exclusive deals, new launches, services, and my email list is the first one to know about any new things coming out. So I highly recommend you get on that newsletter. If you haven't already done so, please leave a rating or a review on Apple Podcast or on Spotify. That would really help to grow the podcast. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. And if you'd like, please screenshot it and tag me on Instagram or on LinkedIn or wherever your preferred social media platform is. You can even email it to me. That'd be great. I would love to shout you out. So thank you so, so much. Without further ado, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Be A Boss Coaching Podcast, a leading podcast where we redefine entrepreneurship through the entrepreneurship journeys of women of color, BIPOC, and queer entrepreneurs. I'm Beatriz Rivera, and as a social worker turned entrepreneur coach and podcast host, I share my own journey and story. I decided to start my own coaching business during the pandemic when I was helping my dad, a veteran business owner, to keep his 23-year-old business open. Since then, I've thrown myself into courses, coaching, podcasts, and books. However, I've learned that entrepreneurship is a journey and we can all learn from each other's stories, mistakes, successes, and redefining the boundaries of what entrepreneurship can be. Subscribe to get new episodes every Monday and Friday on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. But thank you so, so much for being here. I'm so excited to talk more about you and your business and your journey. I I have so many questions. It's just so exciting to see where you are right now. But before we dive in, I'd like you to tell us who you are, your name, the businesses that you have, your business name, and what you do. And we'll take it from there. Okay. I am Brandy Andrews. I am a cosmetologist as well as an esthetician. The businesses that I have is One Youth Dealer Aesthetics which I specialize in melanated skin and I specialize in the pigmentation disorders and skin conditions for people of color. So anything melanin, anything melanin related <laughs> is my specialty. I also have youth dealer skincare, which is a scientifically extracted and naturally derived skincare line. And then I also have my personal brand, which is just all encompassing of what I do. I've been a beauty industry expert for the last 23 going on 24 years. I worked in the hair industry. I've worked in the makeup industry. I've worked in the skin industry. 
I worked retail. I worked on sets. I've worked with celebrities. I've worked with just the whole spectrum of the beauty industry. And so I encompass that. I encompass being an LGBTQ mother. I encompass being a woman of color. I encompass being a first generation American. My mother is a Mexican immigrant and just everything, all my intersectionalities that make me me. Beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing. That's why I'm so excited to learn more about you. Yeah. And I I was reading and going through everything that you have done. But before we get in, and dive, I do want to rewind back a little bit to a point in your life where you attribute to the genesis of your journey as an entrepreneur. And I know it's a big question, but, you know, like, whatever, wherever your heart takes you. Well, I feel like, and I was having this conversation with another accountability partner where it was kind of an, an accidental entrepreneurship. Like when you enter the beauty industry, you're automatically an entrepreneur. And that's not what that's, they don't tell you that when you're going through school. They don't give you the business fundamentals on how to run a business. They don't do any of that. They just prep you to get your license. All this other stuff you have to figure out and hopefully you land in a good place with somebody who's willing to teach you in a positive way. Uh, And I feel like, I mean, this has just been my whole life since I was 15. Like I never really wanted to work for other people I was always either overperforming or not happy and then performing at the average. And it just never filled me up to work for others because I set such a high standard for education and in the beauty industry and inclusivity and things of those sorts. So I feel like, I mean, since the age of 15, I have been an entrepreneur and I feel like it's only really become like being an entrepreneur has only really become a thing, like a a trend of entrepreneurship since the pandemic when Mm, everything shut down and everybody started how to start working for themselves. And they were like, wait a minute, how do we do this? You know? Yeah. And it's like, well, you got to do file taxes this way. You got to do this. And, you know, you don't get health insurance. You don't get benefits. You don't get unemployment. Like we had to fight for unemployment and we were the first industry to get shut down. So it's mm. like, how do you continue to work for yourself when the government could care less? Mm. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's incredible. I, I never thought, I, I mean, so many industries were impacted during that time, during COVID. And it, it's interesting to see the ways all the industries were impacted uh, during that time. Mm-hmm. And how do you continue working for yourself and then working and providing services when everything is shut down. And, and the fact that you mentioned the entrepreneurship, that word and that identity didn't really feel like something until that time because people had to figure it out. (laughs) Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So I totally get that. Totally. Okay. So I know you were in the beauty industry, cosmetology, being an esthetician. So I'm curious how you came to that particular industry and what brought you, what attracted you about that? Well, after going to the vocational schools and doing the bare minimum with any type of college education, I really fell into hair and makeup through my mentor at the time. He was also my hairstylist. And he was like, I need you to go get your license. I need you to go like you have a passion for this. I'm a very visual person. And instead of trying to make myself into something that was more befitting to my family, I decided this is where I want to go. I want to do hair. I want to do makeup. I want to make people feel good about themselves. And I want to make them feel safe. So while I was getting my cosmetology licensure, I had completed what we call op- what we called operations. You had to do like a certain amount of things on your card to like get your hours. I finished at a thousand hours and it's a 1600 hour program and I had 600 hours left. And I asked my dean and said, hey, can I take the aesthetics program? 
can I start taking the aesthetic class? I have nothing to do. All my tests are done. I've already pre-registered for state board. Like I'm, I'm set. And so she agreed that if the instructors agreed to have me in there, which was like a cosmetologist inside the aesthetics realm, they were like, wait a minute, what? Like, that's not like, you have to be quiet. You have to, sh well, what they didn't realize is I was really an introvert and I don't like people. And so, <laughs> right. um, yeah, same. <laughs> yeah. I'm an, I'm an extroverted introvert. One-on-one, -on -one, yeah. I can do it. I'm, I'm here. But large groups of people just give me anxiety. So they agreed. And then I took the aesthetics program. And so I had that underneath my belt. I had the hair. I had the makeup. I had the skin all underneath my belt. I believe I was the first student to graduate from both programs within a year in the school's history. So yeah. I did that. I did skin every now and then, like, you know, to make money. Um, mm -hmm. and then I really started diving into skincare and really decided to change my industry about six years ago when I started, mm -hmm. started really falling out of love with hair. I really started mm -hmm. falling out of love with hair and makeup and the way that the beauty industry ha is, is, and has been portraying a false sense of beauty right. where, where you're continuously having to compare yourself to somebody else. Instead of putting yourself in a safe space where you can try to authentically find your own voice and have somebody mm -hmm. be like, well, you know, you said you like this and kind of being an advocate per se, you know, and then just unrealistic expectations within the hair industry started happening. Like everybody wanted to be platinum, but nobody mm. wanted to pay the price. Mm, yeah. They thought they, yeah. Were, they would get like to this little spot right here. They thought they would get mm -hmm. to this when their hair is this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh you my goodness I mean? yeah and it's yeah. like that's that's a couple you know that's like over a thousand dollar process and people are like can you do it for 400 it's not just yeah. like 400 for just to cover the cost of the product but yeah and it's just like I started just falling out of love and so I started my mentor Dr. Landon McCarroll he messaged me and he said, hey, I need somebody to run my office. I know that you've worked at Laser Away. You know how to run a med spa. Will you come run my office for me? And I said, sure. Yeah, why not? Mm -hmm. I know about skin. I know about all that stuff. I've watched my mother run medical offices my whole entire life. And so I did that. And then that's where I started diving deeper into the pigmentation disorders and skin conditions for people of color. And he started teaching me more and more the non-invasive procedures, how we need to address melanated skin differently that it's right. not a one size fits all not everything is safe for us I mean obviously that's something I already knew from working retail for numerous yeah. years and working with different brands I mm -hmm. would always guide the people they would find me and I they I would guide them to the things that you know were the greatest for me and that's just speaking from my personal experience and so I really started diving into the pigmentation disorders and skin conditions for melanated skin and finding that it affects about 86% of people of color. And that's cystic acne, hyperpigmentation, yeah. rosacea, melasma, keratosis pilaris, like all these things that are kind of common, it affects yeah. about 86% of people and it goes undiagnosed because the, the first initial thing when you start having these issues is they say dermatologist, go to a dermatologist. Mm -hmm. But dermatologists aren't trained. It's not within their scope of practice. The, yes, they can identify something, but they don't have the treatments that estheticians can curate to get the skin clear, to get it clean, to treat it, to find out where it's coming from. And that's where I kind of differ because I take the holistic and the medical approach. It's like, okay, right. like what's going on? Like what is triggering your acne? Not here's a cream. Here's mm, a pill. Yeah. Here's a this. Here's a that. Like, uh, like when you invest into your esthetician, it is a long journey to continue that. Like, because we have to learn who you are. We have to learn your habits. Do you suffer from anxiety or depression? What kind of medications are you on? Do you need to clean out your liver, your kidney, your intestinal system? Like, what are the things yeah. that can be done? And then, and then after a process of elimination, if something can't be solved, that's when we go, this is a trusted dermatologist. Mm, 
right. this is just yeah. a person that you can go to. Mm, I really that that resonates a lot with me because I've always suffered from acne since high school and now as an adult still I have adult acne and so it's making me think to when I decided to go to a dermatologist I was like that that in itself was something I never thought I could do primarily because of insurance and and accessibility Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but even like the fact that I felt like going to the dermatologist even that felt Like, even though it was a a medical, he's a medical specialist or their medical specialist, it felt like something that people like me don't do. Like, you figure it out. Mm -hmm. That people of color don't do. Exactly. Yeah. But people of color are more likely to get skin cancer. Mm. Oh my gosh. And actually, oh my gosh, Brad, you're making me just think to everything because my mom, she has a sunspot same thing I was like mom we need to probably need to go to the dermatologist we did a whole picture and submitted it and they're like oh it's sunspot but it keeps growing and I'm like what are we supposed to do it could potentially now? be melasma you know and that's where you go to somebody yeah. who specializes in pigmentation disorders and skin conditions yeah. for people of color so I would send you mm-hmm. to Landon You know, you have to get your body checked. Skin cancer is almost, I believe it's like 90% preventable when it's caught early. Yes. But even when you do decide to go to a dermatologist, right? A lot of the times I feel like the same, the same experience happened to me. I went to the dermatologist and the first thing that they did was prescribe me a cream. That's what they're trained to do. Yeah. Prescribe me a Mm -hmm. cream and then didn't work. Prescribed me some pills. Kind of worked. But then it really started messing with my hormones, so I had to get it out. So I've been battling with this, and I never have mm-hmm. thought about esthetician, like going to an esthetician, because again, like it's something that I think in you say it in 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 your journey as an esthetician for people of color, like we it, it's it seems as a luxury, but it really should be something we have access to, right, as people of yeah. color. So yeah, that's incredible. But I'm glad you're doing that and doing that work. And I ha- even I, with my own journey as a with skin, I need to call you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Like, and the thing is, is like, you know, a lot of this wasn't, a lot of estheticians are not trained in this capacity. They yeah. do not have this education. This isn't in a, in the textbooks, in the research. You have to go and look to find yeah. it. It's not something that's readily accessible. And so with that, I have partnered with a friend of mine who is also collectively in the beauty industry. This year we'll have 48 years collectively in the beauty industry. Mm-hmm. And we're yeah. trying to develop a school. For already yeah. licensed professionals to come in and learn textured hair, to come in and learn melanated skin, so that they can broaden their scope of practice so that the industry is a safer place for people. Mm, I love that. I love that so much. I, I had a friend um, who I just came on the podcast to also in the beauty industry, clean beauty. And the statistics are, one, also one, not surprising that they're mostly impact negatively impact women of color but also there's there like the fact that you said 86 percent right about yeah about 86 percent of people yeah don't or have conditions right that impact them that are undiagnosed um, that are, yeah and that's I'm not surprised and also that's astonishing like that shouldn't be the case. So I'm glad that you're bringing that education because, again, it, that in that industry, people of color, women of color are always the ones who get the short end of the stick. So I'm so happy you're that. Doing is that is true. Okay. Well, I do want to go into your journey in the beginning as you started your entrepreneurship journey. You know, you mentioned that you were not taught, like they don't teach you the fund how to Run use a those entrepreneur skills right yeah mm-hmm. 
And like, so what were some of the challenges as you began your journey as an entrepreneur, as you started to, to branch out as a business owner? Like, what were some of the initial challenges do you, that you remember? And then how did you address them? I mean, it's all a fluctuation. I feel like the finances mm -hmm. definitely yeah. need to be a course that is given. I mean, we have one built into ours, like, do you file for a sole proprietorship? Are you filing for an LLC? What comes with that? You know, it's mm -hmm. just like now this past year where I started working with an accountant and she's coaching yeah. me through the process of not even, not only being the CEO of my company, but being the CEO of my life. And how do we balance that too? Because yeah. I don't have a regular check that comes into me every two weeks. Mm -hmm. Like I right. don't have a, a set salary that comes to me every couple of weeks. So mm -hmm. I have to fluctuate my life dependent on the demand. Like January mm -hmm. is one of the slowest months. Like I can make $10,000 one month and I can make 2000 the next. Who knows? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. That, the marketing you. behind it, finding your niche, how to set yourself up, the yeah. portfolio, the website, mm -hmm. social media now that is a huge, huge, huge asset, how to utilize that, mm -hmm. how to grow your network, how to build community, honestly, because the beauty industry is very much known for being a dog eat dog type of industry. Nobody wants to help you. And it's all get kept. Getting into the union, forget about it. Especially as a person yeah. of color, double forget about it. Oh, Lord. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Mm-hmm. In the I and mean, I can see that in the beauty industry, right? Because there's so much inform like suppliers and different vendors that I'm sure people work with that are like, no, these are my suppliers. Like I don't want to give you that yeah, information. Absolutely. And instead of passing yeah. on any little type of information that you can, it's very like, no, I'm gonna keep it to me because if you get it, I'm not gonna be able to. And yeah. that makes no sense. Yeah. It makes no yeah. sense. And thankfully I, you know. I'm a bulldozer by trade. And I'm like, you're going to teach me. You're going like, yeah. what is this? What is that? What is this? Yeah. And then that mm -hmm. was the privilege of being the only per only person of color in a room sometimes. Yeah. Is there like, I'm like, oh, what is this? But how does this pertain to people of color? And that is always my question. How does this mm -hmm. pertain to people of color? Mm. I love that. I love that you're persistent. I, I feel like we forget, like sometimes when we say no, right? Or we we hear no or some sort of rejection, it, we're just like, okay, on to the next. And we don't continue to ask or we don't like, well, actually, would you know, tell me, act I'd like to know. <laughs> Be that person that advocates for yourself. And as a social worker, I should know this, right? Advocating for yourself, right? It's one of the best things that you can do. And I think that applies to business mm -hmm. is advocating for yourself in those moments when, people want to gatekeep or you really want to learn and you're hustling to get information and to get yourself off the ground. So thank you for oh, sharing that, you. that huge reminder for everybody. Yes. Yes. And I mean, the thing is, is that the no's get to you. The rejection mm -hmm. gets to you. And I'm not going to sit here and say, I've always been this way. No, that's mm. not, that's not true. Yeah. Have I been a persistent person? Yes. Have I had a constrained brain in order to get tangible results? No. It wasn't until I started working with my business and mindset coach because I would try to do, I would have one goal and then I would have 10 different ways on trying to accomplish it, how, trying to accomplish it. Oh, this didn't work. This said, no, I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. And, and shifting it dependent on what other people were telling me. Not what yeah. I was affirming within myself. Mm -hmm. So all yeah. of that stuff takes takes work. Like you need a business coach. You need, you know, a mindset coach. You need like a healer. You need whoever those, you know, wherever your religious aspects lie. You know, what right. you believe in to bring you to whatever higher power looks like for you. And it's still something that I struggle with. Imposter syndrome. You know, being a mm -hmm. child of mixed race. People yeah. don't take that into consideration when they talk about themselves, you know, or being a first generation. It's like, how do you advocate for yourself when your whole life you were programmed to be small, to mm, fit under yeah. the white paradigm and blend mm -hmm. in 
so that you became more acceptable. I just Mm -hmm. refused to blend in. Yeah. And I think that's what, when it comes to entrepreneurship, it, you have no choice but to figure out how to be authentic, live in that authentic self and try your hardest to not blend into like what other the 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 uh what the word I'm looking for society? majority yes and like societal like expectations of what entrepreneurship should be mm-hmm. uh, and, and entrepreneurship is a broke road let me tell you yeah sometimes you <laughs> yes. are broke yes and I, then sometimes I, you don't know like how to like if you're like you feel broken you feel desperate and you're like should I then conform to what isn't what I see here and when in the majority of entrepreneurship spaces Mm -hmm. where most of them are white or you know male and for me it it feels like sometimes I I feel desperate to conform to that because I'm like is that going to get me my bag? <laughs> you know, like right? it, it, it all comes back to the money wound and the scarcity. And like, you have to get a job, yeah. you have to get insurance, you have to have your 401k. But how can you build that for yourself? And those mm-hmm. things are just becoming accessible to us now. Like yeah. in a year or two, they are just starting to become accessible. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, there was a time where the strikes hit and it took mm-hmm. 70% of my business. I started falling mm. into debt. Right. My, I couldn't pay the rent for my brick and mortar. I had to give up. Mm. I had to give up my space. It was one of the hardest decisions mm. I ever had to make. And mm. I felt like a complete failure, even though I had my mm. community telling me, you know, this is just the way that it is. Da, 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 da. Nobody could stop the voices that were going on in my head. So yeah. I did try to go out for a corporate job that was paying me 70K plus insurance. Mm-hmm. Then. Yeah. When I started advocating for myself as a mother, yeah, opportunity flew out. And I'm like, you yeah. are gaining more from me than I am gaining from you. You'll actually yeah. make more sales because I speak to a completely different demographic. Mm-hmm. But when I started advocating for myself, I said, if I have to leave to get my child, I need, I need there to be an agreement that I am free to do so. Not saying that Mm -hmm. I don't have the help. Obviously, he has another parent. Mm -hmm. He has Mm co-parents. I'm always going Mm -hmm. to be covered. But if there's ever Mm -hmm. that one-off, I need to know that this is okay. Yeah. know that if he's having a hard day at school, because his school at the time was right up the road, that I can Mm -hmm. go up the road. Yeah. Yeah. Ghost. Oh, we found another candidate to go with. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's just like, that was the sign for me to say, I'm not meant to be in anybody's corporate wheel because Mm. I can invest more in myself and get a higher return. Right. And that in entrepreneurship, that's the lessons that we learn, Mm -hmm. I feel, right? Like Mm -hmm. when we're investing in ourselves, like it's really tough to make those investments because maybe we've never made big investments and taken big chances on ourselves Mm -hmm. and they 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 become the our way of survival within this entrepreneurship journey and so thank you for sharing that you mentioned the strikes so can you go a little bit back to that just because just for context because I I feel like it has to do with the fact that you are also an esthetician for celebrities, like you've done celebrities before. Um, so was the, is that what you meant when you said strikes? Like people yes. were like, yeah. yes. So okay. I, work, I work a lot in Hollywood. I work with executives, yeah. producers on top of, you know, celebrities. And so when the strikes hit, everybody's disposable income went out the window. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and the first thing to typically go thankfully I had you know I have a couple of 
you know, loyal clients who are like, I'm not like my skin needs you. Like this is my investment into my self-care, which I'm forever grateful for. And I feel like, yeah. So when the strikes hit, people couldn't, you know, they, they couldn't come. Like I had people who worked with WME and macro and people were losing their jobs. And so when those types of things hit, when people need to cut back on expenses, you know, self-care is the first thing they cut back on. I don't need my gym membership. I can go yeah. on a walk. I mm. don't need to see my esthetician. I can buy whatever I saw off of TikTok or Instagram. Right. Yeah. Damn. I, I, you don't think about the different industries, all of the industries that get impacted for when something like that happens mm -hmm. in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Can you can you go into how you were able how you got into that space into the space of working with celebrities you worked with Lena Waith right is it Waith with or her, Waith? yes yeah i worked yes, with Lena Waith that's mm -hmm. incredible she's an incredible actress uh, like it's she's awesome. also a producer she's the ceo of a production company there's so many things. she's such a multifaceted amazing person Yes. And I'm curious, how did you come to that road of being able to work with with celebrities and people who then were able to spread the word and and let other people know about your services? Because I saw the the quote on, I think, what Puck News. Mm -hmm. That's where I saw it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's awesome. That seems so incredible. So I, I'm just curious how you got into that space and and how it's changed your business and your services in the grand scheme of things. So the, the way that I started working with Lena was I did a facial for one of my best friends. I said, hey, I need content. I need to build out on social media, say that I'm doing house calls again. Can I come do a facial for you? And you post it. She was like, absolutely. We've been friends for like 18, 18 years. And the next day, Lena Wave slid into my DMs and her assistant came into my DMs. And that's how it happened. I just put myself out there and was tagged and asked, you know, those within my network, like, hey, can you, I'll give you a free facial, you know, I'll come do it in your house with all the waivers and liabilities signed, guys, don't get crazy. And then, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, that's, I started working with her. She was suffering from mm -hmm. cystic acne. She had scarring. She had hyperpigmentation. She had a lot of things. And so with the treatments that I started with her, we cleared her skin or she started to see significant difference in about a month or two. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that was because she was willing to invest into her skin. Yeah. I was seeing mm -hmm. her, I think for maybe the first six months, I was seeing her if not once a week, every two weeks mm -hmm. to yeah. constantly like whatever her skin was purging, taking it out, being like, what? Yeah. And it's like simple little questions that you really have to ask people like, what laundry detergent are you using? Are you eating dairy, mm -hmm. consuming pork? You know, mm -hmm. how much do you exercise on regular? Everything that you do comes out through your skin. Mm -hmm. yeah. everything that you intake comes out through your skin yeah. so with that getting her the results she said i i want to be able to go on the red carpet without any makeup i don't want to wear makeup anymore and i said okay mm -hmm. and we got her there in three months and she hit every mm -hmm. award season the following year without makeup mm -hmm. i think the only time she wore makeup was to the met gala and it was mm -hmm. very minimal even met like she didn't really yeah. need to have everything caked on for it to be, mm -hmm. you know, acceptable or or to be up to par with mm -hmm. all the other things. She was able to stand in her own authenticity and stand strong in yeah. the confidence of her skin. Yeah, yeah. And how would you say since working with, with celebrities or different people has changed your business? Like have you seen it? Do you feel like it's helped with spreading the word about your business and and 
how has it impacted your your business overall? I feel like my my business is very word of mouth. Like, I mm. guess I do promote on social media, but at the end of the day, like, I don't post before and afters. I just mm -hmm. don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an unrealistic expectation to think that you're going to get mm -hmm. one facial and all your problems are going to be solved. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's also not an unrealistic expectation for me to to think that I can consistently keep track of like every yeah. time a person comes in in order to use that as marketing. Like, yeah, you're doing everything by yourself. I'm my marketing team. I'm my accounting. I'm my secretary. I'm my everything. Yeah. And so I just choose to continue with word of mouth. Yeah. And know that the results that I have are going to be you know, are going to be seen by those who need it or want it the most. I, I think for me personally, what it's done to my career is to affirm that I am an expert in my field, mm -hmm. that I do know what I'm doing. And just because it doesn't look like everybody else's doesn't mean that it's not right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it would more help with, I would say, my my confidence and my standing in standing in my message of what my services can provide who I am why I do what I do yeah incredible incredible well that actually takes me into this question around because you had mentioned imposter syndrome mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if the way you navigate that has changed as you've expanded, as you've grown. Has that looked the same in how you navigate that versus when you first started when back 10 years ago? I wouldn't say that working with people in Hollywood or working with a, let's just call them higher end clientele, working with a higher end clientele has done anything for my imposter syndrome I feel like it kicked it up even more at one point because it was like are they going to call back are they going to do this everybody wants to work with a celebrity right it's just like that's where you make it no no <laughs> I know yeah that is just the beginning you have yeah. to thankfully I landed with somebody who really really believes in me and who has right. made, um made resources available to me mm -hmm. and has shown me how when you open the door for one, so much more like that person can open a door for that person. And just having those values of like, you got this pay it forward, pay it forward, pay it forward, giving you this information, it inspired me to be like, you to p look at other entrepreneurs and be like, you can accomplish this. It's going mm -hmm. to take a lot of work, yeah. but dealing with my imposter syndrome and the intrusive thoughts in my head, therapy, and yeah. my business coach, my business and mindset coach, Wendy Amata, mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. that was, you know, showing up for myself, you know, really identifying the feelings mm -hmm. and really stepping into something different. And this is mm -hmm. two years I've been working with her and there's still some times where I'm like, whatever. I'm not an expert. I'm not of this. I'm not of that because there's X amount in my bank account. Mm, yeah. But I was tying my worth to my financial standing. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's, that's old programming. So whatever yeah. avenues work for you, I mean, I highly suggest therapy and I highly suggest Wendy Amata. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She, I, I mean, I've seen her work and I've seen everything she does. She's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And even her coming out and being like, I have ADHD, but yeah. she's, but she's been teaching thousands, like hundreds, if not, I think yeah. maybe thousands, like of Latinas, specifically right. black and brown mm -hmm. women, um, on how to combat this, on how to acknowledge it and move through it. Do I believe mm -hmm. that my imposter syndrome is gone? No, not at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's still there. Yeah. I listen to it a lot less. Mm -hmm. And I show up to the spaces not to have people validate me, but to say, hey, I'm not in the best mindset. 
and then have people pour in to me. Mm -hmm. Like office yeah. hours, going to We All Grow. There are some times yeah. where I just sat down on, just sat on screen and I'm like, I can't talk today. I can't do anything. Like I have nothing to give. Like I am mm -hmm. completely empty, but I'm here. Mm -hmm. And type, yeah. type that into the chat. Yeah. Yeah. So it's seeking the support and really finding those spaces, right? Mm -hmm. Those really, in, I would say they feel intimate because they're, they're, they're small, but they, they're so intentional about mm -hmm. creating a space where you there's no pressure and we yeah. just want to pour into each other yeah. and like pour into one another, mm -hmm. receive and give. And so that's the, the energy that, that I find in spaces where you're trying to navigate this world of entrepreneurship, trying to feel confident in your abilities and the fact that you know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And also, like, when you are trying to validate that through through clients or through customers and you don't see that, like, you have to seek, no matter what, even when you do have clients and customers, still seek that community and that support, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. It's so important. It's so important. And talking to other entrepreneurs and other business owners mm -hmm. and being in community with them because... You, it's just you all about know. where you go, though. Like, yeah. I've been to some other communities where I'm mm -hmm. like, I don't resonate with this at all. Like, yes, it's part of my heritage. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's part of my background. But we also mm -hmm. really have to address and take into consideration our intersectionalities. The reason mm -hmm. why I only really belong to We All Grow Latina because it's because they are the first, they were the first community to acknowledge me as a Black Latina, not just as mm -hmm. a Latina. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I am Latina, but I am also Black. So I have completely different things going on that mm -hmm. may not, you know, and they ask to hear my my point. They ask to yeah. hear from me. They ask, mm -hmm. hey, we want to give you a platform. Is this something that you would be open to discussing? Mm -hmm. And I've been in other communities where that is not the case. Right. That is And I can see that. that. Yeah, I can see that in a lot of Latinx communities, Latin, like there's a lot of work that needs to be done within yes. the Latino, Latina community, Latinx, mm -hmm. Latin. There's a lot of anti-blackness as well in different spaces, right? Mm -hmm. And people don't acknowledge it, they ignore mm -hmm. it, and mm -hmm. that in itself is anti-blackness. So like, if I go into any spaces or communities, it's I intake it in, but it's always that work of anti-blackness work that we have to address. Mm -hmm. And it's so ingrained sometimes people don't even know what's going on. And even even just full transparency, even I within We All Grow, I'm like, is this really, like, can we be, like, you know, anti-racist here? <laughs> oh, yeah. We, you know, oh, yeah. And you know. as a matter of fact, they invite you. Yeah. And they yeah. are public about it. And they're like, we do yeah. not stand by this. This does not stand with our fundamentals. Like when yeah. the, what was that, that LA, I don't know if she was a district attorney or something. And she was calling mm -hmm. black people, whatever she was calling them. Well, like, yeah, they, yeah. they unfollowed her. They put out a statement. Like they're very, they're very clear on their intentionalities behind, they, they stand up to their word. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that also within, even within the diaspora, like, I don't, I don't consider myself an Afro-Latina. Mm -hmm. I don't, but people want to mm -hmm. lump me in with the Afro-Latin mm -hmm. culture. And I tell mm -hmm. them, no, I, mm -hmm. I am, there is nothing Afro-Caribbean about me. <laughs> I <laughs> yeah. am not Dominican. I am not Colombian. I am not, yeah. Yeah, I am a Mexican. I yeah. am I come from yeah. Mexico like they're right I come from a small town my mom comes from a small town called Apatingan in Michoacan mm -hmm. you know there were I told just my neighbor yeah. the other day they're like we're from Michoacan and I was like yeah my mom's okay. from Apatingan and they're like oh that's dangerous <laughs> <laughs> yes oh I lord am. yeah so yeah it's just like really acknowledging that you know to circle back to imposter syndrome 
all these different intersectionalities and how they have not been addressed, you know, or making you feel, making anybody feel that they didn't belong in a certain space because either the color of their skin, the way that they looked, if they weren't pretty enough, if they weren't, you know, any of those, you know, things. And to add more onto it, I'm also gay. So it's like there's another level to it when I start getting in the these spaces with other females because of the way I look. They automatically assume. They're like, oh, what does your husband do for a living? I'm like, what? <laughs> you know what I mean? And so yeah. getting into that, having that imposter syndrome too, like I don't belong here because I'm not straight. Mm. But right. being somewhere in like We All Grow Latina where that is embraced that is, right. yes, we want the differences. We mm-hmm. want to All hear how we can mm-hmm. We want yeah. to have a place for you to speak. We want to hear what you have to say when it comes to, when it comes into regards of where your intersectionalities lie. Because your story deserves to be heard. Your story wants to be heard. And people are waiting to hear these stories so that they don't feel as alone. Mm-hmm. Right. I'm just getting into We All Grow. I mean, it's so funny. I went to a event on last week. And it was one of the first in-person events that I had done that I had found in We All Grow. And everyone was like, yeah, I've been on it for two years, but on and off, on and off. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of an experience where I feel because there's a lot to do there. There's so much to navigate and to learn from the app. Mm-hmm. And it's you sort of forget about it, and then you come back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's, yeah. that was the yeah, and that was the experience that a lot of people had with with We All Grow. And think but, about it too, Beatrice. Like we can go and dive into the the aspects of the female relationship, yeah. being in a yeah. room full of women. Being in a room mm-hmm. of powerful women. Yeah. And how long women have been pitted against each other. There, It goes right mm-hmm. into that gatekeeping, all the other things that we're talking about, you mm-hmm. know? And so when you're going into this room, it is an intimidating situation. Mm-hmm. The thing is, is that nobody else can hold that space for you if you're not allowing yourself to be held. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. That I mean, that that's something that we don't even realize we're we're yeah. not allowing ourselves to do, right? Like we're not allowing ourselves, but it it doesn't. You don't become self aware of it until you go into these spaces, until you seek community and intentionally really allow yourself to receive and give in whatever form that shows up on your journey. So, yes. Yes. Seek community. It's essentially Come to office the hours. Come to holding hands. Yes. We'll hold you. Yeah. We'll cry. Tuesdays are for crying. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Tuesdays it. we wear our tears. Mm. Oh, I love it. Tuesday tears. That Tuesday should be the tears. thing. That is our yeah. hashtag. Well, it's actually is Yorona it? Fest. We know. Oh, no, Yorona not. Fest. We always call it Yorona <laughs> Fest. It's like, all right, here comes the Yorona Fest because when one of us cries, we all cry. Everyone <laughs> cries. And it's great. I mean, that's how we heal and that's how we continue in this journey. And that's what what I feel entrepreneurship can look like as well, right? There's mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's so many different ways. Okay. I I do want to go into what skills do you believe you need to grow and nurture as an entrepreneur and business owner? Like what would you say are some of the skills that you believe are are essential to to growing your business? Financial skills, budgeting, mm. accounting, keeping track of your money, what goes in and what goes out. So getting over and, and uh, not over, moving through and embracing your scarcity mentality and how you can reframe it. That's definitely a top thing because if you're consistent, like I don't have enough clients, I don't have enough this, I'm not going to build this, there's not enough views, there's not enough this, you're going to stay in that constant cycle of scarcity and it's it's not going to build. Your personal boundaries definitely personal boundaries because if, again if you're continuously outputting and you're not finding ways 
and you're not finding ways <laughs> you're not finding ways to pour into yourself, you're gonna get burnt out. I still do it. I still do it. All these things that I say are things that I continuously practice. I don't like to say that I've mastered them or because I have the blue check mark or because I have X amount of followers that it's all success all the time. It's not. It's not. And I think once people become one with that, you can start to accept the no's as, you know, just little, it's just, okay, that wasn't for me. What I need hasn't shown itself yet. And who knows when it's going to show itself, like releasing an expectation. So really working around the boundaries that you have around time, around money, um, around people, around people pleasing. It's another thing around people pleasing. Um, there's so many times where I probably could have said no to pour into myself. And I said yes in the fear of disappointing somebody or somebody being upset with me or what are they going to think, you know, and caring about what they thought. Instead of being like, look, this is just something that I had to do. If I have to be the villain in your story, then so be it. And being okay with that. Taking care of your mental health. Building your mental health muscle. Absolutely. Completely and utterly dire <laughs> to be an entrepreneur. Because there are going to be times where the lows get low. Mm. The lows get accept. low. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been on food stamps. Mm -hmm. I've been on unemployment. I've done all of those things and those uh, just know that all those things are temporary if mm -hmm. you allow them to be temporary. Mm. You I have like to, that you said. You like what? I like that you said if you allow them to be mm -hmm. temporary. Because I, I would have, I'm doing it less, but I would catastrophize. One thing would happen and then a whole narrative would just lay out in front of me, like on, like on chat GPT. It was like, oh, I'm going to come up with every awful scenario that I possibly can to know that yeah. this is going to fail and I'm a failure. And so my Wendy did bring something up to me the other day where she's like, it's even the small successes, even the little things like not catastrophizing, being in control of your emotions. <laughs> that is an effing superpower. Mm, yeah. Being yeah. in control of your emotions in order to make concise and accurate decisions. Um, another skill. I feel like those are my top ones because even around building the personal boundaries, you know, that's you have to be around people in order to do that. You have to be mm -hmm. around community. You have to open yourself up. So with whatever boundaries it is that you have around that, um, building those muscles Mm -hmm. I feel like they're more muscles than they are skills. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. like I also, I, I also went into trauma release coaching, which is a person that I met in my mastermind mm -hmm. and didn't even really know what it is that she had necessarily done. I know that she was, you know, a hypnotherapist and things like that. But when I, when I had said in one of our meetings, I said, it's getting really hard for me to stop the videos that are playing in my mind. So when mm -hmm. I'm in a triggered state, I'm a very visual yeah. person. So being in a triggered state, whether it's my child that has triggered me, my mother, my brother, my dog, you know, really finding the coping tools to regulate my nervous system. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm really yeah. diving into this year is regulating my own nervous system. And mm -hmm. what does, what do I want to identify as not from what somebody tells me not from what an in instagram post said not from what this other person did that you don't know their circumstances this world was not built for people of color to succeed mm -hmm. so we're actually yeah. breaking down these barriers as we go yeah you yeah. know even with like uh who was it fearless fund the fearless fund they're being sued mm -hmm. for reverse discrimination against white people okay. for only funding black and brown businesses. Mm -hmm. Like on a state, sta like on a government standard, they, yeah. this man is going, this white man is going and suing them. So this world is not built for people to, for people of color to succeed yet. Yeah. It yeah. is up to us. It is up to the storytellers, the podcasters, 
the, the content creators, the CEOs, the fa- all of it. It's up to all of us to make sure mm-hmm. that we are continuously open, opening the door for the people who mirror us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or and who are building that there. space, who are mm-hmm. building that, that, like you said, it not yet, right? But they're doing that work through business or, or activism or values that they hold. Mm-hmm. So, even yoga yeah. classes, even yeah. people of color who are like, I want to do yoga classes in, in Spanish. I mm-hmm. want to make sure that my product is bilingual. Yeah. I want to make sure that, you know, uh, somebody's comadre can read this inside mm-hmm. a Whole Foods or inside a store or wherever it is that they go. Yeah. And they can feel seen. Mm-hmm. Like, ah, yeah. they made this for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a, and the, I think that's what the reason why I primarily want to work with women of color, BIPOC, queer, LGBTQ entrepreneurs, because those are the sto- that's how we continue to collectively shift how we can walk along our journeys as an entrepreneur and continue to create those those discussions and conversations through conversation I feel like through conversation is how we can really begin to shift those those narratives yeah so that's incredible thank you so much Brandy for sharing all of that I do want to wrap up with what are some particular experiences that as an entrepreneur that you believe more women of color, queer, BIPOC folks experience. What are some particular experiences? Mm. You need to go where you see yourself. If you walk into a room and you can't relate to one person in there, because the first thing that I do when I walk into a room is I look for the person of color. I'm like, Mm -hmm. where are they? Yeah. And if I'm the only person of color in the room, and I'm not being heard. I'm just there as, I don't know, the token. I don't mm-hmm. want to be in that space. Yeah. Removing yourself from places where you do not feel safe and heard. Mm-hmm. Safe and or heard. Yeah. So yeah. just know that all of your intersectionalities make you who you are. And that's a superpower, not a deficit. It's mm-hmm. not a bad thing that you are multiracial, that you're first generation, that English is your second language, that you're queer, that you're BIPOC, whatever how you identify, mm-hmm. that those are all a superpower. Yeah. And go into the spaces where your superpowers are either mirrored, um, brought up, enhanced. You know, because now mm-hmm. I walk into a room and all I see is people of color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the white people are the minority. Mm -hmm. I walk into rooms Mm -hmm. now where white people feel uncomfortable because they're like, (laughs) I'm the only white person here. It's like, yeah, buddy, what are you doing? Did you get lost? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. I love that. I got it. (laughs) I love it. I love that. And it's so true, right? Because it's almost like when you do walk into spaces where you're the only person of color, it... (laughs) Sometimes I feel like if you haven't been going networking or, or finding community that of people that look like you, you you all, you normalize that discomfort. You mm-hmm. normalize when you go into those spaces and you're like, oh, mm-hmm. this is normal for me to feel uncomfortable. And then you then you find the spaces where you don't and you're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> and so you have both experiences like you have lived both through an experience where you're the odd one out you feel uncomfortable and when you're like oh this is my people these are my people Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. I feel like that's a very unique experience like I think only people of color can really truly experience that yeah Um, and then just find some find somebody to mentor you as well find a mentor find somebody Mm -hmm. who's willing to teach you like Mm -hmm. for lack of better terms like Lena has been a mentor to me She's been mm. like, okay, so we're going to sit down with this person. We're going to talk to this person. We're going to do this. And if they tell us no, we're going to find a way to make it a yes. 
Did you do that? Yeah. Apart? Have you set that meeting? Have you done that? And it's like, how do you even keep track of me with everything you have going on? Like, I don't understand. Like, <laughs> damn superpower. So, yeah. like, it's, it's insane. It's insane. Yeah. Mentorship is so, coaching, mentorship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so vital. So vital. And community, so. Yes. 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 All of those things. Well, thank you so much, Brandy. I, I could, I would. I could go another hour asking you <laughs> questions and talking to you. I loved hearing your story and just like that, like what your values are and who you are as a, as an entrepreneur, um, as a mother, as a queer mother and woman of color, Latina. So before we wrap, where can people find you? How can people get in touch with you or learn about you? And what's the best way to learn about you? So you can go to my website, brandyjandrews.com, to learn about my skincare and all of my other things in the aesthetic realm. You can go to youthdealer.co. You can find me on social media. It's Brandy J. Andrews across all platforms, Instagram, TikTok, all those things. Or you can email me, brandy at lunavibe.co. <laughs> so I will have it in the show notes. So definitely go to the show notes and click on all the links, follow Brandy, support, comment, like, share, and, uh, and follow all the, all the supporting things you can do. <laughs> so thank you so much, Brandy. This was amazing. Thank you for sharing your story and your presence. And, and I hope you can come back because I have so thank many more questions. <laughs> thank you for having me. I look forward to coming back. Awesome. Thank you for listening to the Be A Boss Coaching Podcast. Remember to come on over to the BeABossCoaching.com and book your free discovery call where you can learn more about coaching with me, what it takes to start a business and grow the skills while growing your business at the same time. I'm excited to learn more from you. Remember to sign up to our newsletter and come back every Monday and Friday for new episodes.